All right. So guys, again, thank you for being here. Um, this is our catching webinar that we're going to be doing with Joe Claire. So Joe played at Tufts University. She graduated in 2014. Um, she won a national championship three times. It was 13, 14, and 15. 13 and 14 as a player, 15 as a coach, and also was a three-time All-American. So tons of credentials. <laughs> and now Joe has founded her own um, softball catching business in Boston, right? You're in the Boston area, right? Yep. Yeah, called Protect the Plate. So lots of knowledge she can share with us. Um, excited to be on a webinar with a fellow jock nerd. So why don't we get into it? Um, to get started, Joe, give us a little intro. And um, I'd also love for you to explain the NESCAC to people. Oh, that's a good question. That's a good starting question. So hi, everyone. Um, Joe over on this end of things. Um, thank you, Caitlin, for inviting me on here. This is awesome. I feel like catching is a topic that is so big in, in the big scheme of softball, but yet not something that gets talked about often. So um, I am always happy to talk catching um, as a former catcher in, in a position that's pretty underplayed. Um, the brief part of my story is that I grew up in uh, central Connecticut, um, played for a team called the Connecticut Eliminators growing up. And as I went through high school, kind of my passions for uh, attending a high academic institution while also being able to play at a high level um, were kind of came together. And that's what landed me on Tufts. I was really fortunate. Um, I didn't even, hadn't even heard of Tufts um, in the beginning part of my high school career, which is kind of crazy to look back on, but really fortunate that um, Coach Milligan came, um, came through in my recruiting process and I, I landed at that institution. And um, looking back at my four years, it challenged me in every way that I possibly could have been challenged as a person, as a player, um, you know, as a student. Um, and again, it really combined my, my passion for wanting to be challenged in the classroom and out on the field. Um, again, like you said, I do have a, a long list of credentials, but at the same time, like just so um, humbled to be a part of all of those things. It was a really special era in tough softball history um, to be a part of both as a player and as a coach. And I'd be happy to, you know, dive into what made that maybe successful at some point. But uh, yeah, I'm just honored to have been a part of it. Um, and since then, I, I spent a few years coaching at the college level. I did stay at Tufts one more year after I graduated, um, which is when the third national championship was won. And then from there, I actually found my way out to Southern California. Um, some people on this might have heard of the Claremont Colleges. So I coached at Claremont Mud Scripts for two years um, and, and really thought, really found my niche in coaching. Um, but something was missing when I was coaching at the college level. And um, I had been giving lessons on the side and um, I, I had always loved working with the younger players and really like seeing the developmental side of things. And that wasn't necessarily prevalent at the college level. The college level is just a lot faster. You have to get kids ready to play a lot quicker. Um, and I really wanted to be able to dive into the kind of development side of things. So moved back to the Boston area, just this is where my family is from and really decided to try to build my own program. Um, and that is what Protect the Plate is, a, a training program just for catchers. So I don't teach hitting right now. I don't teach fielding. I don't do anything but catching. Um, and, and people think I'm crazy for it, but really like my bucket is completely filled with how many people A, want instruction and B, how much there is to teach out there. Um, and so, you know, I've found myself plenty busy with uh, building a platform just for catchers. So that's kind of how I've gotten to where I am right now. The NESCAC is super weird and super awesome at the same time. Um, and I think you can sympathize with that being a fellow NESCACer at, at Williams College. Um, it's just this small, small conference of really high academic schools, primarily in the Northeast. And um, it's just this weird blend of kids that are really, really smart and wanna be at smart schools, um, but also like have this insane passion for athletics. And sometimes I think people think that there's a trade off between a, a high academic school and a, a, like a highly competitive athletic school. Like it's an either or situation. And that's where the NESCAC's just weird and awesome because it actually isn't a trade off at every single one of those schools. It's like, no, we're gonna push you to be the most awesome student in the classroom because we know that you're gonna go do awesome things in this world. But also like we, we value sports and like the transformational power of them. Um, and so we're gonna push you to be the best sports, uh, you know, the best athletes and on the best sports teams. And I think 
the the stat that you just have to point to is how many national championships are won at the D3 level by NESCAC institutions. And I mean, you know, as much as I like will rack, rack on like Williams College, um, just because they're, you know, a huge rival of mine, um, they finish like first in the Lear Cup almost every single year. And for those of you that don't know, the Lear Cup basically measures like how good all of your sports are. Um, and so by finishing first, they're essentially saying like Williams is good at a lot of sports. Um, but that's a huge testament to those student athletes. So, I mean, they're not only students and they're not only athletes, but they're student athletes and those, those schools are pushing them to be good at both. Yeah, you summarize that really well. Um, you know, and I too, I didn't know of Williams when I was first playing, especially from Texas. It's a, it is more surprising to me to hear about you not knowing it from Connecticut, but that yeah, almost- it's embarrassing. Don't. <laughs> it makes you feel better. Um, but, you know, it's, for me, academics was always a really the most important thing, um, even with my insane passion for softball. But yeah, it's such a cool balance there. I think at Williams, we have some crazy stats, so don't quote this number exactly, but in this, in, this might be the same at Tufts, 60% play a varsity, at, a varsity sport, you know? Yeah. You don't hear that any, uh, many other schools. Um, so that was really cool because you're around so many athletes that also value academics. So yeah, that was really fun. Yeah, and it's a huge, I mean, the last point on that is like, it's a huge testament to the like institutions at large, because I think that th those administrations for the most part are really behind the idea that sports um, are a really good thing. You know, I think again, kind of going back to that, like either or notion, I think there's a lot of schools out there that, you know, God forbid you're an athlete because you're dumbing down a student population. Like, not at not at those schools like at those schools i mean if anything i think the stats say like uh usually the athletes have a higher gpa than the students just because their time is so much more regimented and so much more structured um so a uh, kudos to those administrations because i think they've really gotten behind this idea that like athlete uh that sports can be transformational and that like athletes as a part of our student population are a really good thing yeah absolutely so um, I think your story is somewhat unique because you, from what, from when I saw you play, so I was a senior when you were a freshman and then I stayed and coached one year. So I got to see your sophomore year too. And then obviously was around, I go back to Williams still three, four times a year from Houston. I'm a freak like that. And then my sister went to Tufts, right? So lo I love Tufts um, for sure. Don't tell Coach Herman I said that. Um, your so secret's me. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, with the way you played the game and with your athletic stature, are you I think six feet, six one? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm about six one. Yep. Okay. Right. Um, so catchers on the call, you can be tall and catch by the way. Don't let anyone tell you, you can't do that. That's good to know. That's good to know. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, you had your pick of different institutions, different levels of softball you could have played. You've kind of already touched on this, but what really in the end made you pick division three and what made you specifically pick the NESCAC and then Tufts? Oof, that is such a good question. And, um, you know, I feel like my answer now that I have like the perspective on everything is so much different than maybe what it would have been if you had asked me when I was like 16 or 17 and, and had made that decision. And boy, am I like sitting here, you know, five years after having graduated, like, I am so glad I picked what I did. Um, and I think inherently, sometimes when you are uh, a sophomore, junior, senior in high school, like you are taking a little bit of a risk. Like you don't always know what you're getting yourself into. And again, like, boy, am I glad on the other side of things that this all worked out um, for me. Again, I kind of, um, I, ha I did have options at, at all of the divisions, mostly locally within um, New England, you know, New England's a hard place. It's a little bit different than like where you're located in Texas. Um, you know, the softball, the caliber of softball is not quite as high. I will completely admit that. Um, and usually typically New England kids just stay within New England. Um, but I think ultimately what it came down to for me was what I really wanted to get out of my experience. Um, and, and the more schools that I looked at, the more coaches that I talked to, the more programs that I had a window into. And again, it, all from the perspective of like, you don't really know. Um, it really became evident to me that like my ability to do it all was going to be at a division three institution. And I was just that kid in high school that 
wanted my hands in everything. I wanted to be a really good student. I wanted to be a really good athlete. I was in, I was in extracurricular clubs. I had a job. Like there was, I just, I'm, I'm that person that thrives when I'm the most busy. Um, and like every minute of my day is scheduled and has something to do. That's just who I am. And that's where I thrive. Um, and again, I knew I was going, I, I wanted to be challenged. I didn't want like the academic piece to come easy to me. I didn't want the softball piece to come easy to me. I, I wanted to be pushed to really figure out like what was I capable of. Um, and again, not, there's no slight here against any of the other divisions or any of the other schools. Cause at the end of the day, like as a prospective student athlete, and I, I tell my kids all the time, this like, you've got to pick what's going to make you the most happy, not what's going to make mom and dad or your coaches or your, your skills coaches, like, like a person like me, the most happy, like at the end of the day, these four years are for you to thrive and for you to find your place. Um, and you're not going to do that if you're not happy there. Right. Um, and so, you know, my ability to do it all really kind of that, that mentality kind of fit that mold at division three. Um, and specifically, again, I don't really know what it was about Tufts. I just stepped on, people talk about having those moments of like, you just know. Um, and I don't think it's like this. Okay. So it's not like you just step on campus and you're like, ah, this is it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think, again, the more I like looked at schools um, and then kept going back to Tufts, I was just drawn by a lot of different things. Like walking around campus seemed very natural to me. Um, talking to the coaches um, and, and especially Coach Milligan felt really natural to me. Um, you know, the idea of being pushed, I was like, OK, this is going to be hard, but like I want that. This is what I'm after. Um, so it kind of just you know, as time went on, those pieces all kind of just fell into place. And again, like I said, knowing what I know now, like you are taking a little bit of a risk because you don't know everything. Um, and I can fully say on the other side of things, like, thank God I did take the risk I took because I really ended up in a place that I, I ultimately was able to thrive. Yeah, awesome. And let's talk a little bit about the differences between Tufts and Williams, because while they're so similar in a lot of ways, they're extremely different. Um, you know, so for me, coming from Houston and going to a completely rural area where you're in a valley surrounded by mountains and the nearest mall is 30 minutes away. And <laughs> at yes. first, you know, coming from such a big city, it was really shocking, but then I loved it, totally fell in love with it and loved that being out in the middle of nowhere, not hearing the highways, everything. Whereas Tufts, but it, I like this about Tufts too, it's kind of a small town in a big city. Um, so you still get a little bit of that separation, but I mean, how was that for you, you know, it, it, being in an area where you were separated, but you were still next to the big city? Was that a good fit for you, you know? Yeah, that was an awesome fit. I mean, I think where you're trying to go with this question is like, you know, every school is going to be different. And the first piece of advice that I give to anyone that's looking for my advice, you know, that's currently a freshman, sophomore, junior in, in high school is like, the first step to all of this is like, you got to get yourself on campuses, right? Because people are like, well, like, I got to send these emails. And I'm like, who are you sending the emails to? Like, you haven't even been on a campus yet. Like, come on, right? Like, don't put the cart, the cart in front of the horse here, right? Um, I mean, I think if you ask like a freshman or a sophomore, okay, I'm saying the word college, what do you think? They're going to like think of like what they see on like TikTok or Instagram or in movies of like people like on tables, like screaming or, you know, these fancy libraries. And it, again, like that stuff does happen. I'm not trying to say it doesn't, but at the same time, like that is not college, right? That is not all that college has to entail. And so really in order to like have this, like a little bit better of an idea of like, what is college? You've got to get yourself onto campuses. And again, where, where whoever, wherever you're located in the country right now, like unless you're in the middle of truly nowhere, my guess is that you have schools all around you right now that you can go to. I mean, not at the current moment, but like when, when it's safe to, like you can go to, right? And I'm not saying you're going to go to those schools, but like you can probably find a pretty big school close to you. You can probably find a pretty small school close to you, a rural school, a city school. And so go to those and then be like, oh my God, I hate that and I love that and that's cool and I want that. And then you can start to make that list based on the criteria that is really speaking to you, right? Um, and so ultimately, like, yeah, Tufts, like, really fit the bill in terms of what I was looking for because um, I, I went to a big high school. I graduated with 500 other people, so there was about 2,000 kids in my high school. It was huge. Um, and I knew I didn't want to go to anything smaller than that. And at the same time, um, I'll give you, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll 
I'll tell you the truth. Like I was looking at Yukon a lot because it was like right in my backyard. That school is huge. And like, as soon as I kind of, the more I looked at that school, the more I was like, uh, I don't know if I can deal with like 10, 20, 30,000 people on one campus. Like this just seems so overwhelming to me. Um, and again, like kind of the more I looked at schools, like I, I love Williams. I've been out there, you know, a number of times, but like for me, I was like, uh, oh, that's a little bit scary to be like in the middle of nowhere and like have nothing around you. Again, this is all just like, you loved that. And that's awesome. And like, that wouldn't have been the right fit for me. For me, it was like Tufts is this little city within the larger city of Boston. And I get the ability to be a part of a small campus. That's probably about seven, thousand eight thousand kids big right for undergrads but then like if I want to like Boston's right there and I can just go in and see what Boston's all about right so again until you really get yourself on campuses I think it's just really hard to grasp what that's all about yeah um and I love what you said too because it it reminds me of this interview we did one time with one softball we were talking with the head coach of Arizona Mike Andrea and he was talking about one of his biggest advice but some of his best advice for athletes and parents when they're going through the recruiting process, pick a school that you would love, even if you didn't have softball there. Cause so many times I think we see a team play on TV or we, we follow them, we fall in love with a player or whatever. And so we pick that school where kind of, we've got blinders on it. Oh, the program is amazing. That's such an important part, but it is not the only piece. Yeah. I mean, that is so, that is so important. And I think the other way to the other way to think about it is like if softball wasn't there or if the coach wasn't there when you get there. Um, I think sometimes when we're going through the recruiting process, it's really, and like, this is taken, this is taken from advice, knowing what I know now did not know this when I was, you know, in high school is um, it's a very real possibility that the coach you get recruited by isn't there when you get there. And, and that's because coaching is a job, right? And just like your moms and dads are trying to be, become better doctors or better accountants or better lawyers, like these coaches are trying to be better coaches. And sometimes that means moving up levels or moving to more successful programs. And again, it's nothing against the institution where they are like this, that's just life. And so for me personally, like I really attached to coach Milligan when I was going through the recruiting process and thank God she did not go anywhere because again, that was a huge part of my decision, but had she gone there? Like, I think I still would have loved Tufts, but it would have been a lot harder to love Tufts without her there. And again, I know that's really hard to hear maybe on the back end of things, like when you're, you are pro prospective student athlete, but it's really important to grasp because there is a chance that they're not going to be there by the time that you get there. And are you going to still love the school just as much if they weren't there as when they are? Yeah. And now of course she's at West Point, right? right. So, I mean, then that's awesome. That's so great for her. Great for her career, but totally it, that new class that potentially fell in love with her, like you did, um, right. has had to deal with that transition. So that's a really great point. Yeah, I was really lucky that I didn't have to deal with that, but it's, it's, it's tough. It is. I mean, and there's just no other way to, there's no other way around it. I mean, like there, there's a lot of coaches out there that are really charismatic and really awesome people. And as a 16, 17 year old, you're like, ah, I would know nothing more than to play for that person. And that's mm -hmm. awesome. But like, sometimes like they're going to look for, be looking for another job. And it's, again, it's nothing against them. Like that's what they need to do too. Yeah, and this is a big generalization, so this does not apply to everyone for sure. But, you know, I think sometimes as female athletes, we like to be pleasers and we like to please our coaches. So I would imagine, and I've never coached boys, so I can't speak to it, <laughs> but that we put more of an emphasis on that relationship maybe than some male athletes do. You know, so that's it's an important, it's hard for us to separate that, but you're making a good point. We, we've got to be able to like other things besides just the coach. Yeah, I mean, I do think there, uh, I think that is a big uh, generalization. And at the same point, I think uh, that there's merit in that. And I think there are gender dynamics at play. Um, and especially like if, for me, at least as a, a female athlete, like I never really thought playing for a female or a male coach was a big deal until it was a choice. And, you know, Coach Milligan was one of the first female coaches that I had played for. And I didn't realize that was a big deal until I like was already in it and I was like wow this is this is a lot different right and mm -hmm. a lot different in a very good way and again that's not a slight to any male coaches that are out there um, I just think that a female voice in the head coaching role offers a way different voice than a male coach in that role and so sometimes I do think that comes into play when when going through the recruiting process 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think that can lead into a good point that when you are playing and when you're going through the select ball system, high school, whatever, maybe it's good to experience different coaches, you know, experience male, experience female, see what you like. Um, Cause that will, it lo- sounds like it made, you know, it was a factor for you. Yeah. I, I mean, I think I, if, if that's a possibility for, you know, young athletes to explore of, of playing different playing for different genders, playing for different ages. Um, Again, you and I, Caitlin, we coach, we're super young. Um, I'm not even going to sit here and pretend like I can understand half the things that they're saying at this point. And I feel like I'm not that old, but at the same point, like playing for someone playing for me versus playing for even like coach Milligan, who again is not that old. If she ever listens to this um, is versus coach Herman, who is no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, (laughs) <laughs> you're going to get a different experience, right? And um, you're going to just like there, with with age comes more knowledge and w- wisdom, and and it's just like it, you're just going to get a different experience. But at the end of the day, like you get to pick that ex- experience. Yeah. So when and obviously the recruiting landscape has changed so much. But when did you commit to Tufts? Um, that's also a good question. Um, the high academic world is very weird. Um, again, going back to the NESCACs in that most of it is tied up into who you are as a student. And so um, I think the word commit can mean a lot of different things at this point in 2020, um, where the point at which Tufts was willing to support my application um, and get behind me as a as someone that they were actively recruiting, I believe came in the fall of my, early in the fall of my senior year. Um, again, I, I think it was over the course of that summer that I had kind of decided like Tufts was my number one choice. Um, but when you get to that high academic thing, it doesn't always matter what's your number one choice. A lot of the time it's what they also can handle um, just from their acade- on the backside on their academic piece. So I think it was early in my um, senior year that basically both parties mutually decided like we're going to support each other through this process. Yeah. So, I mean, that's almost a little bit more similar to what kids are experiencing these days since with the new rules and not being able to talk to them till June, uh, what is it? September 1st of junior mm-hmm. year. So, um, and how did Tufts find out about you? How did you get their attention? You know, a lot of luck, Caitlin, a lot of luck. <laughs> um, again, New England, I'm embarrassed to admit it at this point, knowing how good of a school Tufts is now, but, uh, Again, I, I sat in front of a TV as a kid and watched the College World Series every year. I mean, softball is on way more now than it ever was. You know, it was just the World Series when we were growing up. Um, and I sat in front of it and wanted to go to all of those schools. That And, like, I'll tell you, my dream school was the University of Michigan, and I wanted to play for Coach Hodge. Um, I actually grew up in Michigan um, before I – when I was 10, we moved to Connecticut. And I just, like, wanted to be a Wolverine more than anything. Um, and as I got through the recruiting process and as I got older, like that dream, you know, wasn't going to come to fruition, um, just simply because of where I was from, how good of a player I was. Um, but you know, going back to it is like, I think we have these like dreams out there of like what we can and and can't do. Um, but then there's like reality. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, Tufts wasn't on my radar, didn't even know it existed. And then, um, it was some point this summer, um, early in the summer, actually before my senior year, um, that actually, I think, um, coach Milligan walked by a field that I was playing on and had said basically to the coach I was playing for, like, this kid needs to look at Tufts. Um, and I was, again, I was really, really lucky in the fact that there was actually a pipeline of, um, people from my organization that, that ended up playing at Tufts. So once I kind of figured that piece out of it, I was like, oh, this isn't just out of the blue completely. Um, but had Coach Milligan not walked by that field on that particular day, we might not be having this same conversation right now. And I, again, I think that's on that backside of it now that I am where I am. I think there's a part of it that's still luck, right? And then I think there's also a part of it, like a player can do a lot to ha- have control of their destiny. What tournament were you playing at? This random one in the middle of Connecticut. Okay. So I wanted to ask that because a lot of times, you know, we, when you're playing on travel softball, you can go all around the country. Um, and then you may end up at a school in your backyard, right? For me, yeah. I played all around the country and then it helped me because at Colorado, that's when I met coach Herman and how I found out about Williams. Um, so any advice for kids, you know, when they're on travel teams and maybe let's say you're a Texas kid and you want to play in Texas, mm-hmm. um, 
what's the benefit of being on a travel team that travels? I could argue both sides. Um, I could argue that if you are a Texas kid and you know you want to stay in Texas, then what the heck are you doing with your time in terms of traveling all over the country and uh, spending lots of money and lots of time when you know that you want to play in Texas, right? Um, and there's probably teams, regional teams is what kind of like what we call them up here is like regional teams of that they're that is what their goal is, is to place kids within the region of where that, that team is located. But on the same point, Caitlin, to like your, to what you just said about your own experience, like had you not traveled to Colorado, you might not be a Williams grad. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you might think you want to play and you might think you want to go to a Texas school, but like, do you really know that? Um, and again, like uh, the jump from like living in, Te I've never lived in Texas, but the jump from living in Texas to going to like, you know, middle of nowhere, Massachusetts is a huge one. But again, would you maybe know that if you hadn't taken the risk of doing that? Probably not just because like, why would you have, why, why, would, why would you have that information? Right. So I can argue the other side too, because like, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And at the, at the end of the day, like if it puts you on a path that potentially, you know, meets with a coach that they express interest and you go and check out that school in the middle of Massachusetts and you're like, holy crap, I love this. Like that just worked in your benefit, like a lot. Right. So yeah. I think there's, I think you can argue both sides, but at the end of the day, it kind of comes down to like, what is it that you want? Um, and how far are you willing to go to get what you want? Absolutely. Yeah. Cause I, I answer that question a lot with families and you know, my response to it is I've shared my own story, but also just, I do like, and it's all depends on your family situation and you know, there's tons of factors that go into it, For sure. but I do like that when you get those opportunities to travel, you get to see other parts of the country. You get to meet other people. You get to see how other parts of the country play softball. You know, people always quote California. They just play ball a little bit differently than some other areas. Um, so, you know, I like that. I think that's kind of the answer I've given in the past. Yeah, and I would, I would definitely jump on that bandwagon behind you is like, in high school, I mean, even now with, with my, with our age right now, like experience is experience, right? And like, get out of your bubble right? Like Texas is way different than Massachusetts where I live. But like at the end of the day, like I want to come to Texas. I want to see Houston. I want to see how you guys do things. I've never been there. Like that's on my bucket list of places to go. Right. And Boston, whoever hasn't been there should be on your bucket list of places to go. Like this is where the country was founded after all. Right. You know, um, no, I'm only kidding there, but like <laughs> there there is merit in traveling and interacting with new people and, and interacting with people that are different than you. And, and that's just not, that's not for high school kids. That's for everyone at all ages. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay. We're 30 minutes in and we haven't really talked about it. <laughs> and I feel like we could talk about this all day and yes. you, you have had a couple questions come up. Yeah. I think I want to switch it to catching and then we'll catch some of these questions at the end if you're good. Cool. But before we move over to catching, we are doing a couple prize giveaways, right? Yes. Okay. You want to tell um, them what they're getting. And while that's happening, I'm going to draw somebody randomly out of our uh, Zoom attendees. Yeah. Let me go grab one over here. Hold on. Awesome. All right, guys. So we're going to do two prize giveaways. This is from uh, Joe's company, Protect the Plate. All right. I got choices of t-shirts. So... You can go with a nice protect the plate or you can go with a nice logo with mask and plate. And I have gray and blue. So you just got to decide what size, what color and what logo you want. And it's yours. Okay. Awesome. All right. Let's pick our first person here. All right. Let's go Kaylee Batista. Uh, Kaylee Batista, thank you for being here. You've won one of Joe's Protect the Plate t-shirts. So shoot me an email, ccain at texasblaze.org. I'll get your info and then I'll shoot that over to Joe. Thank you so cool. much. And we get more PTP repping out there in the world. That's winning. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Maybe we can be some of the first Texans to wear your stuff. Yes, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, cool. So let's switch over to catching. Guys, keep dropping questions in the chat or on Facebook Live because we're going to get those at the end from Joe. Um, what do you want to start with with catching? Oof, you're just like uh, blowing the lid off of everything, right? <laughs> um, let's start with the fact that, I mean, I said this when I, when I opened it up. Um, I think catching is 
it's a it's a position out there that coaches have no problem getting mad at the catchers when something goes wrong um, out out on defense. But at the same time, for how mad we can get at the catchers, we're not putting that equivalent time in to train them properly. And and I think if there's one message and again, there could be coaches on this call. There could be players on this call. I think if there's one message that I have for everyone, no matter really who you are, is like, we need to start prioritizing the development of catchers. Um, and you might be like, oh my God, I don't know anything about catching. Okay, that's okay. You don't need to know everything about the position, but you do need to make the decision to prioritize them and prioritize their development. And if you are a catcher and you play for a coach that doesn't prioritize your development, you need to be over there being like, hello, hello me. I need some training too. Right. Um, I, I think when we think about all the other positions, we think about the pitchers, like they get their bullpen practice, right? We think about the infielders and the outfielders, they get ground balls, they get fly balls. And then it's like, okay, well, what do we do with the catchers? Well, they can catch infield when, you know, we're fun going or they can catch bullpens. And it's like, yes, those things have merit to them. Like, yes, we can get better from doing those things, but we're not going to truly be able to own our development unless we actually focus on developing them and and allowing them to have very specific practice geared towards that position so i think that's probably where i would start is like we need to start prioritizing this position because it is a really big fundamental position out on the field and it does have there is a lot of power right um within within the catcher and and as a travel ball coach you probably walk by fields all the time or your own team is like your catcher can make or break your team, right? It's like, you'll be watching a team and you're like, wow, that team is humming along. Most likely it's because they're like, not the only piece, but most likely it's because of, because their catcher is also really good, right? And, and sometimes when the teams aren't humming along, you kind of dissect what's going on along. And it's like, well, there's, there's balls going to the backstop. We're losing strikes. We're dropping balls, right? Um, Throwdowns are going all over the place. So I think really like, um, the fact that they have that much power and the fact that they, you know, uh, can make or break your defense, like we need to actually prioritize them and allow them to practice and develop as well. So, you know, hitting lessons are such a common thing. Um, and you being a catching instructor, do you think <laughs> that catchers need to take private lessons or what should they be doing to craft their skill? Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, I think the first part of it is I don't know if I'm committed to the fact that they need to take lessons per se, um, just because I think that um, they can get the practice that they need without maybe having the one-on-one -on -one attention of a coach. But at the same point, again, that kind of goes back to what I was just saying is like, if you're not going to take lessons, then at some point you also need to like prioritize your development and, and do the practice on your own. And I think that we can empower young women to do that on their own but we I don't know what we as coaches and like me as a skills coach I don't know if we've given them all the tools to be successful on their own and know what they need to be working on if that makes sense yeah absolutely um do you have I guess what are the top skills when you think about catching what makes a well-rounded catcher what skills do they need okay so think pyramid right um what's happening what is the catcher doing the most within a game, okay? They're receiving the ball the most. So um, this is a, a personal thing. I don't really like to call it framing because I think that suggests that the catcher is doing a lot back there. I don't really want the catcher to be doing a lot when it comes to receiving the ball. I want them to keep the strikes the strikes and I want them to throw the balls back to the pitcher. Um, and yeah, there's merit in making sure that those balls around the strike zone that we're winning those what they call stry balls. Um, I want you to win those, but I don't want you to turn balls into strikes. And so um, that's why I don't really call it framing anymore. I do call it receiving, but kind of going back to prior priorities here, like you're receiving 100 pitches a game if you catch a whole game. It's probably somewhere in the vicinity of 100 pitches, right? That's 100 opportunities for you to do something and do something well. And so when it comes to practicing, I know this sounds silly, but like we got to practice receiving and we got to practice it a lot because you're going to do it a lot. Um, I think next on the pyramid, so like that's the bottom of the pyramid just because it's the biggest. I think next on the pyramid comes throwing. Um, Yes, as you get older, I would argue that not as many runners are, th are stealing bases, but at the same time, like um, throwing is really important um, and, and 
becoming a better throwing catcher is something that's 100% in your control um, and doable and with, again, some proper instruction and proper practice. But um, being a good throwing catcher it, it is really important. And you don't necessarily have to have that gun. You're looking at someone that did not have the gun um, that you see sometimes with, you know, with catchers or third basemen. But again, you can be good at other things within a throwdown and still manage to get kids thrown out. I think kind of the last piece of it um, is blocking. And again, I'm not saying blocking is not important. It just doesn't, especially as you get older, it just doesn't really happen quite as often. Again, if you are catching a drop ball pitcher, maybe you are blocking a lot more than you're throwing. And in that case, you got to make blocking a priority for yourself. But kind of generally speaking, blocking is going to happen the least. And therefore, I, I would practice it the least. doesn't mean you shouldn't practice it because you should. Those are kind of the three fundamental skills. But I like to think of it as a pyramid of like, what are we spending the most amount of time doing in a game? And thus, let's program that or practice that the most often. So who's your favorite throwing instructor? That would be Mr. Austin Wasserman of High Level Throwing. Um, Austin and I came into contact. Our paths crossed very very early on in my coaching career um, at this point, probably about three or four years ago. Um, and we do everything high level throwing with catchers. And um, I think that throwing is, I mean, I, I don't have to be over here <laughs> hammering that point home of how important it is. I'm just another voice saying how important it is. But throwing is one of those things that like, when you get to the college level, like they don't have time to teach you how to throw and they don't have time to teach you how to throw harder. And again, when we think about catching like throwing is a fairly important skill and we want to be able to throw the ball hard so if you prioritize that as someone that's like maybe in 12u or 14u and by the time you get up to college you have correct patterns and you're getting stronger and now you're throwing the ball even harder oh my gosh amazing as a catching coach i can teach you how to exchange like the transfers the exchanges i can teach you how to do that with we can spend a few sessions together and your trans your your transfer your exchange time will decrease your throwing velocity that takes years and years and years and years to develop um, the right patterns and then also build the velocity so again i don't have to be over here preaching the importance of uh you know throwing because i already know that you guys do it at, on your end yeah you, you know we're a huge fans so um and i love that connection i actually sent the link to him today so Hopefully he gets a chance to pop on, but, um, hi Austin, if uh, you do end up watching. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so he came in September, I think to work with our teams and then we're going to have him back at our blaze Jamboree in September this year, awesome. um, which will be awesome. So yeah, huge fan of him. Um, yeah. okay. So with your pyramid, I wanted to add a layer, uh, Go ahead. where do you think body language and communication fits in, if it's in there? Um, well, you're always throwing me curveballs, right? Uh, the most important. And um, I'm sorry that I didn't include that in the original pyramid. Um, that's probably the most important thing. And arguably, that's the thing that's most in your control, right? Um, receiving, like, if your pitcher sucks and they're throwing a lot of balls, like, it doesn't matter how good of a receiver you are. You're not going to be able to turn, you're not going to be able to get strikes, right? Um, same with blocking, same with throwing, like, the most thing that's in your control is your ability to control your effort and your attitude right and again when you get to the college level like as a coach I don't really want to have to like coach you on that that's something that I need you to develop when you're a lot younger and again I coach plenty of so protect the plate is primarily middle school and high school kids and then the college kids come back and train when they're on their breaks but I see a lot of middle school catchers really struggle with communication um because it is a little bit nerve wracking to get out in front of the, the field, in front of the fielders, in front of the plate and, and communicate what's going on. But practice, 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 right? Um, and I always say like, start easy and get more difficult, right? So can you just simply communicate the number of outs? Yeah, you probably already have that in your head, right? So in between every batter, can you go out in front of the plate and just make sure you're looking at every single infielder and saying, hey, guys, we got one out um, with, a, with an affirmative voice, with, with a, a confident voice. And again, I'm not saying this is easy. We practice this in class because I know it's really difficult for kids. Um, but start easy and then get more complicated, okay? From outs, move to what the play is going on. From the play, move to, hey, is there any steel threats? And really making sure that you're in communication with your shortstop. Um, 
again, you're looking at someone, yes, I was named a three-time All-American. I'm going to be completely honest with you. That was primarily from the fact that I was a really good hitter. Um, not to say that I didn't, I couldn't catch the ball. I was a decent catcher, but um, even back there, my throwing, my, my ability to throw runners out, that was not my bread and butter. My bread and butter was, I, I was a really good receiver and I communicated well. And if you're ever able to pull up any game film of me, you will see me out in front of the plate between every single batter and like three or four feet in front of the plate, making sure that every single fielder is on the same page as me and making sure that the pitcher in the circle circle and I are also on the same page and I can't understate the value of um, you know communication out there leadership and really making sure that um, you and your pitcher are also on the same page yeah and I like what you mentioned about looking at everyone on your field and making sure that they're looking at you know that you're on the same page because also right. who is everyone on the field looking Ooh, at that's not good <laughs> I was trying to make this better so I didn't look like a zebra oh no worries <laughs> repeat that question for me again yeah. So, you know, you mentioned going out and looking at everyone and making sure you're on the same page. Who is everybody else on the field looking at? Exactly. Right. <laughs> you. Yeah. Right. Three and pit. again, I know that's really, it is nerve wracking and, and, and not to say it's just nerve wracking for in, uh, middle school. Sometimes I see high schoolers too. Um, and, and if you're on the call and you're, you would quantify yourself as like an introvert, but yet you're a catcher, I'm not saying they're mutually exclusive. You don't have to be loud and obnoxious to be a catcher, but you do have to be able to command your voice and you have to be able to speak, um, confidently and affirmatively and and really it's your job to really make sure that everyone is on on the same page there um and, and again people are looking for you to do that so you don't get you don't get to decide like i don't really feel like doing that today like that is your job and that is the most important of um all of the things that you could possibly be doing awesome all right so pyramid we've got body language communication receiving throwing blocking could you give us your favorite, one favorite drill for each one? Oh, that's so hard. <laughs> um, well, I, I will tell you um, before I give you my favorite drill is um, when you're, when you, when we finally get to that point where you say, okay, I'm, I'm important and I want to practice, right? Um, I'm not saying that there isn't merit in like partner drills or a coach, um, you know, soft tossing some, some balls into you or tennis balls. Like those are all good things. And I don't want to take those away from anyone, but really if we want to challenge catchers and make it make practice more and more and more game, like, right. That's what we're always striving to do as coaches. Then you really got to figure out, okay, how do we do that for catchers? And the, and the answer is velocity, right? And you're like, okay, well, I don't want to burn my pitchers out by like throwing 200 pitches just so my catcher can work on receiving. I get it. I understand. I wouldn't want to do that either. There's this wonderful thing called the pitching machine. Um, and if a player has access to one, they need, as a catcher, they need to use it. Um, and I know that might sound strange if you've never done it before, but I can't, I mean, in class, we almost exclusively have the machine on, um, a lot of the time, especially as they get older and we're just looking for, to get reps in and really challenge them. You can get so many quality reps in receiving off a machine, blocking off a machine, um, transfer throwdowns off a machine. And, and thus now, now you don't have to rely on someone tossing to you. Like, thanks mom and dad, but you're not always the best at tossing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you don't always have to rely on a pitcher, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think if, again, I'm not saying everyone has a pitching machine in their backyard. I think that's part of what we're up against right now, kind of being in this weird quarantine uh, mm -hmm. area. So right now, if you got a tennis ball on a wall, like that's great, use that. But in the, in the future, when we get back to quote unquote normal, you got to find access to a pitching machine, even if it's every once in a while, just so that you can get reps at velocity that aren't just a pitcher throwing to you. Um, so I think when it comes to um, receiving, I think my drill of choice um, is really just as simple as like a tennis ball on a wall um, and making it difficult for yourself. So um, you might say, okay, like, what are you talking about? Um, we usually use these like little wiffle balls in practice um, in classes sometimes where like they're holding it basically the wiffle ball like right here and they have to use these two fingers or these three fingers to catch. Um, I think that gets really difficult really quickly. Um, putting, you, you probably have access to wrist weights if you're, you know, a high level thrower, um, putting the wrist weight on your, um, 
your uh, receiving wrist and kind of making using weight to in order to really focus on like okay can i stick this pitch with no movement okay now i'm going to add weight on to it so i'm really working all these these forearm and arm and shoulder muscles um i think there's there's some stuff out there right now that we've been experimenting around with bands and really having like an anchor point um, you know, on a fence or something, and then the, the J band around your wrist and, you know, having to work against bands pulling you in a different way, but any, anything really to challenge a, your hand eye coordination, and then B like your ability to have to like really stick those pitches. And again, as a, for younger catchers, that's really hard to do because typically they're kind of off balance um, and they might not have all those muscles developed, but again, start, start easy. And then once you get the hang of it, progress and make it harder. Um, I think blocking, so blocking is one of those skills that like almost exclusively should be done on a machine. And I know that sounds crazy, but like me sitting here and, and being about five or six feet away from you and pegging you with balls, you're going to do every rep perfectly because you know that the ball is coming at you. Like I'm going to be over here being like wonderful, but like you're not, you're still going to be like, Coach Joe, I can't do it in a game. And I'm going to be like, yeah, no crap, because you don't know it's coming in a game and it's a lot quicker in a game. Right. Um, so again, I know sometimes like we don't always have access to pitching machines, but find one if you can at a facility or maybe your travel ball team has access to one. The biggest success I've had with blocking is not actually putting normal balls in the machine. So we all, we know what um, like light flights are, Caitlin, um, mm -hmm. the squishy balls that you hit for, for um, hitting, mm -hmm. putting those in a machine works wonders um, and, and aiming it again, kind of at the ground so that it has that, that short hop block. Um, then we aren't going to make kids terrified of blocking. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, blocking is crazy because it's like, yeah, let's throw our body in front of like a 60 mile an hour pitch. Yeah. That sounds like a good idea. Like who wants to do that? No, like no one does. Right. Um, so like the biggest thing, especially at a younger age, like a middle school age, like the biggest thing that we can do is make kids unafraid of that. And the only way we're going to make them unafraid of that is if we like make it safe to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you are, um, if you're like, I don't have light flights, I have to use like some semblance of a ball that has weight on it turn the speed down a little bit, or um, I actually heard this, I learned this, so I haven't had the chance to um, try it out myself, but getting like um, soccer shin guards and putting them on your arms, just so again, like when, if we get hit with a ball, we're not going to ever want to do that again, because it is going to hurt. So really minimizing like the fact that we can like scare ourselves out of blocking is the best thing that we can do. But again, using a machine and using velocity is how you're going to become a better blocker and the the final progression the progression that always gets kids like having fun and also is extremely hard is take that lock off the pitching machine that aims it down and the person that gets to decide on the other side like how high they want it that's the ultimate test because you could throw a high pitch you could throw a strike you could throw in the dirt and now the catcher truly has to react to what is going on which that's what happens in a game right so yeah. that's what we want to do when it comes to um blocking i think when it comes to throwing the biggest bang for your buck with throwing is it is the exchange right we've talked about throwing velocity like you need to do be doing all your um long toss and, and your weighted balls and all that kind of stuff big proponent of high level throwing if you haven't picked that up yet um you need to be doing all that in order to um get that arm nice and strong but that's only a part of the throwdown, right? The exchange is the other part. And for those of you that don't use the word exchange, it means from the time that ball hits glove to basically the release, right? Um, and I'll throw some data at you, basically Olympic level, you know, like our Amanda Chittisters of the world, um, our Olympic level catchers, their exchange is somewhere between like 0.6 and 0.7 of a second. So it's, it's extremely fast, right? Most of the kids that I'm coaching in the high school level, I'm seeing more in the like 0 0.8, 0 0.9 range. And again, that's not to say like, we're not trying to get down to 0.6, we are, but just to kind of give you a frame of reference. So I think your biggest bang for buck to becoming a better throw, throw downer, if that makes sense, um, mm -hmm. is the exchange, right? Um, and I think, again, my favorite drill um, that you can do with exchanges and you can do it with or without a pitching machine, it definitely makes it a lot harder with a pitching machine, is basically um, a coach throws the first ball at you or the, the first ball on the machine, you receive it, right? And then they put another one, so the ball is in your glove and 
another one in and, and you take the ball in your glove, you transfer it, and then you basically catch the second one that's coming at you. Um, mm -hmm. It kind of makes it a little bit more interesting. And then if you want an additional challenge, reverse it. And basically uh, the coach is going to put almost two balls in at the same time, transfer the first, and you got to do it fast because the second one's already coming at you. And then you're going to catch the second one. So really anything to force you to have to get that ball out of your glove quicker is going to drive that exchange time down. We had someone ask, um, what speed would you put the machine at for 12U? Do you have any answer, you know, for ages and stuff? Um, it's a good question. So I typically kind of think about like what would be a, what's a pitcher's velocity and trying to, again, that's the, the point, right? So using kind of like that 60 mile an hour threshold of like, that's probably, you know, pitchers above 60 miles an hour in upper high school are doing really well for them themselves. So um, if you're in 12, you maybe bump it down to somewhere around like maybe 50 miles an hour or so. Caitlin, does that sound right? Um, yeah. And I think you want to challenge them, right? Maybe sometimes right. make it harder than it's going to be in a game. So yeah, that sounds pretty good. Right. So like start, start somewhere, right? Start at 45, 50, make sure they're not afraid of it. And then basically if they're like, Hey dad, or like, Hey coach, like this is easy, crank it up. Like, okay, keep going up. Right. Like, sometimes I make the middle schoolers or the high school catchers keep coming closer and closer to me um, off the pitching machine to make it that much harder. Right. Yeah. Awesome. So did you have any videos that you wanted to share for any of these drills or just, you know, share some that your athletes are doing? Sure. Um, I, uh, it's not really drill oriented. I mean, actually they, I guess they are receiving off a machine. So sure. It's a drill. Um, but I actually wanted to, um, this, I could talk about this forever, but just very briefly, kind of wanted to talk about a phenomenon we're seeing a lot more um, in, in the um, softball ranks of basically a one knee down stance. So if, you want, if you're watching baseball out there these days, which hopefully you are because um, our baseball player, you know, we, we can learn a lot from that game. Um, we're seeing catch a lot more catchers with a, in a one knee down stance. Right. Um, and so I've started to bring that over to softball. I'm definitely not the first one, so I'm not going to take credit for that. Um, but I think you're seeing a lot more catchers set up with, um, a knee down and I can go into all the reasons of why like that is really beneficial. Um, but basically it's getting you lower to the ground. One, it's able to help you work under pitches two, which is a really good thing. Um, and three, like from a health standpoint, like, we're putting a lot of pressure on our knees when we're catching. And so the ability for us to um, take some of that pressure off our knees and, and really be in a little bit more of a relaxed stance is a good thing. Um, and, and if you're like, well, how do I block out of that sense? How do I throw out of the sense? Like that's the fun. We get to figure all of that stuff out. Right. But um, at the very least right now, we're starting to really experiment around with like, is this something that um, works and like, can it be done at the, the high, uh, sorry, on the softball side of things. So I'll share you my screen right now and see if I can show you, um, can we see this here? Yeah, it's sideways. I don't know if you're yes. able to flip it. Rotate left. There we go. Ah, there we go. I, I apologize. It's like, the light makes it like weird when you take video, but I think we can get the, the hang of this here. So this girl's name is Reagan. Um, you can see that she's going to be in this one knee down stance. Um, you know, it's her glove knee that's down. She's also got a wrist weight on, so you can kind of see that. Um, but uh, basically, again, it's going to allow her to get much lower to the ground here. If we can ever get a ball into this, there we go. Um, going to allow her to get much lower to the ground she can get under that low pitch right that's an in, that's a low inside pitch there so uh, Jeff, it's playing for us it is or not it's not yeah it's can still on the uh, sideways view. oh really yeah. oh because you know what it's um hold on i grabbed the wrong one there's two of them on here Grab the one that I wasn't playing. No. <laughs> okay. Now, can you yeah. see this? Yes, perfect. Okay. So it's kind of going to be in slow mo, so I apologize for that. But um, basically, she's in this one knee down stance. Um, it's really going to allow her to get underneath these balls that are coming in here. Um, 
and she's a lot more comfortable, right? And at the end of the day, like we want catchers to be comfortable. If you're comfortable, that means you're going to be able to do a lot more things, but you can kind of see that, you know, her arms nice and relaxed. She's able to work underneath these pitches low inside is a super hard location for a lot of, a lot of catchers. Right. And by dropping this left knee out of the way, we're going to really open up our ability to um, catch that low inside pitch. So it's your receiving side leg, the receiving side knee that you always have them drop. Yeah, I, I am challenging um, players not to like live in the world of absolutes. So like of like always dropping that knee. Um, mm -hmm. But typically with a right-handed catcher, that is the knee that we want to drop just because we can, um, you know, we get that knee out of the way and it's not inhibiting our ability to, to receive. But at the same time, like play with both knees. Like, again, an, another big piece of advice I can give is like, do not be afraid to do things differently. Um, and you know if if major league catchers are doing this they play at a way higher level than we do right so they've clearly got to be doing something right over there and again i'm not saying baseball and softball are the same game but they're similar enough that we should really be looking at what those people are doing and saying hey is that something we can apply to the game of softball and if it is great if it's not okay we'll move on um but don't be afraid like if coaches are doing things differently, that's a good thing. That means they're trying, they're afraid to get out of their box and they're trying new things. Right. And so my challenge to players is like, you shouldn't be afraid to do things differently and get out of your own box as well. So a lot of times when you see it in the MLB, you know, they'll have a knee down and then the other leg out to the side. What's the difference here where you've got them knee up or leg out to the side? What do you recommend? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, good question. Um, I think that's traditionally called a kickstand. I have not personally experimented with that too much. Um, I really like the, what you can see with Reagan in this stance is like, she does have quite a bit of weight on this right foot of hers. Um, and again, the, the game of softball does move really fast, right? And there's a lot of slappers in our game. There's people that bunt. And so we still do want the ability to move back there and be able to, um, you know, get out of our stance if we need to so she still does have quite a bit of weight on this leg and if someone does lay down a bunch she's going to be able to get out of that super easy um i think sometimes like the more complicated and weird stances you get sometimes they're a little bit hard to get out of them i personally haven't um brought kickstand over to softball but that doesn't mean that there aren't people out there that are trying it yeah we have a, a player uh lolo on our 18 united team and she does the kickstand with her right leg out um, she's had knee surgery. And so there it's go. way more comfortable for her. She can get lower. She feels like she's a better receiver. So yeah, she's experimented with it a bit. And that's awesome. Like, I mean, again, at the end of the day, like we need to do, we need to do what we're comfortable with. And if, especially if we have something going on with our body that doesn't quite allow us to get in what people would call traditional, like figure it out. And if you still want to catch, like figure out what works for you. And if you're still able to get strikes and receive the balls and throw, like, props to you. Like I'm pumped to hear that about a kid that she's willing to do things differently in service of herself. Yeah, absolutely. Did you have any other um, drills you want to show them? Um, I didn't have any up here. No, but um, again, I like, I, I can share at the, towards the end of this, Caitlin, um, you know, how people can, can get in get in contact with me and i'm one of those people that like i just want i just want catchers to get better um i think it's such an underrated position and under top position that i'm more than willing to share anything and everything that i have and that i've learned um in service of a kid or a coach getting better so you know to whoever's listening on this if you want to reach out to me um because you're like i need drills or quarantine sucks and i don't know what to do with my time um i am going to figure out every way to to basically get you um what the information that you're looking for awesome yeah we'll definitely get that info to everybody at the end so why don't we take some questions oh, or before we do you mm -hmm. mentioned earlier about a pipeline recruiting pipeline how that can kind of oh, happen yeah. right so um we do have a blaze coach now my sister christian kane so she went to Tufts mm -hmm. and then um, you played with Chris Parr who uh, played for the Blaze. And I think you said played with you three years, maybe. Yeah, Chris was, uh, Chris is uh, a year younger than I am. And uh, so we overlapped for three years and um, I'm not sure where you're going with the recruiting pipeline, but if I had to guess, like I think recruiting pipelines in um, travel ball organizations are awesome because again, like, 
tap in for the prospective athletes on this call, like tap into the resources that you have, right? Like Caitlin, you played at Williams. Like why is every kid not on your team coming up to me? Like Caitlin, tell me everything you know about Williams college. Like I want to hear what it was like to be a student athlete there. Right. And, and same with, same with um, your sister, like going up to her. Right. And if these other recruiting pipelines exist within organizations, like you, the younger players should be knocking on the door of those college kids or those recent grads being like, okay, you have the firsthand knowledge. Like I want to know everything. Um, that's how you're going to get the most amount of info, not, not going on a tour or, you know, I mean, you'll get info from doing all that stuff for sure. But like, here's your chance at firsthand knowledge, like use everything that you possibly can to really learn um, what you need to know about the, the, the school and the recruiting process. Yeah, absolutely. That goes back to what we were talking about with, you know, really getting to know the school before you go there, not just falling in love with one part of it. So yeah, absolutely. You, that is where I was going. <laughs> I'm glad I could uh, guess. Yeah. All right. So we got some questions. And then yeah. after the questions, we're going to share your info, Joe, and then we'll do our last prize giveaway. Perfect. Um, so Cam asks you, did you have anyone to push you to become how you are today? Um, my brother, in all honesty. Um, yeah, my brother. He's three years younger than me. Um, he he is an extremely um, competitive athlete as a former, I guess we're washed up at this point, former athlete as well. Um, he played ice hockey, a little bit of baseball um, and some other sports. And, and again, just growing up, like um, we played all the sports and we were encouraged to go in the backyard and mess around. I mean, people, you know, have always said like, coach, oh, you're so good at fun going. I mean, I'm good at fun going because I used to hit fun go to my brother until like, we couldn't see anymore outside. Um, you know, I, I had the mastered, like the glove, the, the ball out of the glove and then the one hit, like I wouldn't do that anymore, but I had like mastered that. Um, so I think my brother, like we're just insanely, we're, again, I will admit it to our, to my detriment. I am very competitive and I'm competitive with him because I didn't want him to win at anything that we were doing. Um, and, and I, I credit my parents a lot. They really fostered the fact that we were competitive and that we loved sports and they were willing to do what really whatever it took within within their means to to find us success I mean you know a brief story is that my again my brother was really into ice hockey my dad built us an ice hockey rink in our backyard I mean again it wasn't like and again, this is funny because like you guys are in Texas, so it doesn't quite get that cold or snow, but um, up here it definitely does. And, uh, you know, it wasn't anything fancy or, you know, insanely creative or something, but, you know, a, basically a big pool of water that freezes and our ability to go out in the backyard and skate before school, after school. I didn't play ice hockey, but like, again, I just didn't want my brother to be better than me. So I was willing to figure out how to like cheat all of my ways through winning the games. But um, I, I really credit a lot of, I know that sounds maybe a little bit strange, but I really credit a lot of my success to him just because we were constantly pushing each other back and forth when we were growing up. Awesome. It's always good to have that person that pushes you for sure. Yeah. So um, another question, what made you want to play softball? <sighs> that is also a really good question. Um, I think when I was younger, I just played almost every sport that was out there. Um, so I don't necessarily know if there's one thing when I was really young that got me into the sport, but I think um, why I stuck with the sport. And it's funny that, that you, that someone asked me this question because um, in having classes virtually right now with um, with kids, we've been talking a lot about like our purpose and why we play the game, why it's important to us, why being an athlete is something that we identify with. So I've actually thought about this a lot in the past few weeks because they were asking me this question. Um, I think why I stuck with it ultimately was because it's softball is this like weird combination between being an extremely individual sport and yet being a very team oriented sport. Um, and there's not a lot of other sports out there where there's this insane individual element of like think hitting like it's all on you it's just how much practice and how good you are as a hitter and your battle between the pitcher and the hitter right like that's very individual there's no one that's right there that can dig you out of that hole right it's just you and the pitcher but at the end of the day like it's a team sport like we win and lose as a team right and so like it's the collective ability of all of us individuals to band together with these like hits and these runs right and to work together on defense that ultimately we either win or we lose because of it so I think 
it's just that weird combination of an awesome combination of being okay all eyes are on you at this point but also like we win and we lose as a team I, I can definitely relate with you on that I love the combination because um, I loved the pressure being in the box I loved the pressure of being a pitcher and but then at the same time the team camaraderie and playing for the girls that was probably my favorite part in the end so yeah I love that answer yeah and I think like the second part of that answer just kind of what you just said is like so many people ask I've been asked a lot um like what made you such a good hitter like you were a very very good hitter what made you so good honestly like I look back at my swing for all of the stuff that we know now and all the technology that we have now and I'm like all right that was a pretty good swing not like the best that's out there especially with what we're seeing in division one softball I mean even all the divisions in softball these days but um it was that mentality like I loved being in the box like I wanted the battle with the pitcher like get, and, and that comes back to that competitiveness like give me the bat like, give it to me. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to get a hit. And I think I see so many kids that are just like, I don't want the bat. I'm I, I, like, I suck right now. I don't have my swing. Like, I don't feel good. Blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, I had all of those things going on too. But like, at the end of the day, it was like, I want the bat, right? Like, I want this battle because I want my chance to win it. And there might be times I don't for sure. Like, <laughs> I don't win every time, but like, give me the chance to maybe win. Yeah, we had very similar mindsets there. <laughs> well, I mean, that would be why we had very similar like careers and successes, right? Oh, I don't know if we can say that, Joe, but no, thanks. No, <laughs> you, you were successful in your own right. Okay, so we touched on this a little bit uh, earlier, but um, next question, two question, two parts. How did you find the school that was the best fit for you? Did you go to many schools before you got to Tufts, basically? Okay. So we touched on it a bit, but you did mention already visiting campuses and regardless of if you even want to go there, just go find the type of campus you want. You want. Um, anything else you'd add to that? Um, so the answer is yes. I went to a lot of schools. I dragged my parents. I don't know what the number was, but I, and I knew I wanted to stay in New England. Um, Tufts was ultimately about an hour and a half from where I grew up. Um, but I dragged my parents all over New England because I didn't really know what I wanted. And so I just went to as many schools as I possibly could. I actually did look at, going back to Michigan for a second, I did look at Michigan. I wanted to like kind of explore that route. So fortunately we went out there and, you know, visited all. Again, it was my dream school. It continued to be my dream school, but ultimately I really wanted to play softball too. And so we, I kind of had to make that decision of like, I'm not going to be able to play softball there. Um, but Interestingly, I think the one last point I would add on this is like, when I think about that initial list of schools, it was like, because my mom went here, my dad went here, uh, my best friend goes here, uh, you know, my guidance counselor said this school is a good, it wasn't my list, it was like a list of like, acquaintances and like, what I had heard, right. And so I think, at least when I'm like advising, I'm on the other side now advising prospective student athletes, like, don't do that, right? It's not a bad way to go about it, but just like, you're not going to hit every school that's out there, i.e. Tufts. Like that would never have come up had Cheryl not passed that field, right? Um, so if, if anything, kind of go back to my advice earlier of like, use the area that you are in right now and try to hit on all of these like different, um, like they have different aspects to them and different characteristics to them. And then from there, um, you're really able to say, Hey, I want this. I want this. I want this. I want this. And then you can curate a list of schools that have all of those things. That's if I could go back and do it now, I don't, again, I don't know if that would still land me at Tufts, hopefully. Um, but I think that's a way better way to do it than just being like, well, I heard this school was good. And like my mom went to this school and you know, dad went to that school. So like, let me build my list that way. Yeah educating yourself in the process it's not easy right it takes a lot of work um and i think that's something that you know a lot of times and this isn't a knock on anyone but being a select ball coach we get the well oh the coach should be handling the recruiting for me or the coach should be doing this and we are there to help you but we're just one branch out of every uh, everything that you should be utilizing in that search so for sure i mean it's 99 percent on the kid in the family right I completely agree with you on that. And I think the one thing I would add, because I think what I see a lot is kids putting off getting started because they don't know where to start and it's very overwhelming. I think the one thing I would add is to those prospective student athletes listening, like it's a big school project, 
That's what you got to think about it as, right? Are you going to do your big school project that's due in two or three years from now, the last night? No, because you're not going to be happy with the result and it's going to cause you a lot of stress and anxiety along the way. But if you take that big school project and you chunk it out, out over two to three years and you really say like, okay, I'm going to try to do something every week, not every day, but like every week, how am I going to get a little bit closer to my end result every week? Then it's not, I mean, it's going to be stressful regardless, but it's not going to be as stressful. It's not going to be as full of anxiety and you're going to see real progress along the way because you have been chunking it out. Spoken like a true Nescacker. <laughs> yes, I know. Sometimes it really comes out. I'm sorry, everyone. No, and it's perfect because the next question is, how early do you think you should start looking at college? I think that's a really good question. Um, this might be a little bit more, says a little bit more about who I am and like maybe where I'm from. But I firmly believe that uh, you need to get yourself into high school before you even start thinking about college. Like you can't think about college until you actually like even have a concept of what high school is all about. And I would maybe argue from there too that like let yourself have your freshman year um, and really get your, get your freshman year under your belt and really have a kind of a firm grasp of what high school is all about and what kind of your road through high school is going to look like before you worry about that next step. And I think if you really start at the end of your freshman year, like that, that summer between your freshman and sophomore year, I think that could really set you up really nicely for the, that summer and then the following, um, summer as well. But you know, that's just my personal experience. And again, it, it, use your sophomore year. If you start then use your sophomore year to find what you want. And then because you can't talk to softball coaches anyways, until the start of your junior year, like if you can hit that um, deadline and say, Oh my God, I already know what I want. Like, that's amazing. Right? right. And then you're not, you're not being like, uh, I just want to play softball. So I want to go to your school. Cause I want to play softball. Like, no, you know what you want out of school. Yeah, I love that. I think the one thing I would say just that's you, I've already talked about being on campuses. So, you know, I think the one exception to that is that I don't personally, I think it's great for kids to go out and do that at any point. You know, mm -hmm. that doesn't matter. That doesn't mean you're really necessarily looking at college. You're just kind of seeing what's out there. Um, but I love what you said because, you know, I coach 18U and 14U, totally different animals. <laughs> um, sometimes in 14U, I personally struggle with, even with the recruiting changes, how much college coach presence that does. I want those kids to get to play and not worry about college. I mean, when I played, you did not talk to colleges until your junior year. It just, it didn't happen. The big recruiting summer was in between junior and senior year. So I played my entire freshman and sophomore year of high school without worrying about it. And I just got to play for fun. So, you know, I love what you said, because I think, yes, I mean, we need to provide opportunities for our kids and everything, but I would really love if at 14 you, they could actually just play for fun and not have to worry about any of that yet. Yeah. I mean, whew, that's like loaded in there and there's so much in there, but I think again, like put off it feeling like a job for as long as it possibly can, because once you make that turn around that bend of it again i'm not saying when you get into college it's not fun anymore it is it's just a different version of fun um but once you make that turn around like hoorah rah, we're just here to like win some softball games and like make some best friends to like okay like this is something i'm really serious about and i want to play around play with other people that are really serious about like once you turn that bend there's no turning back and so mm -hmm. like if you can put that bend off um, as long as possible, like in your, into your freshman year, into your sophomore year, I just think your longevity is going to be that much better. Cause you, cause if you, if you turn that corner too early, you're going to get, I, I, wanna, I don't want to say everyone, but it's more likely that you're going to get very burned out and very tired of, of that grind. And I don't want that to happen. Cause there's a, there's a lot of kids out there that have tremendous potential. And Caitlin, I think you'd agree with me. Like playing college softball is one of the best things I've ever done with my life. Mm -hmm. And if, if every, and I think that's why I do what I do now, because if everyone can have a taste of what I had, then like, they're going to have an amazing life in front of them. Like, that's just how strongly I feel about the experience. And so I want kids, to, I want more kids to have that experience and not uh, turn another bend of basically saying, yeah, no, this is, this is not for me anymore. Absolutely. Right. You just said it. Once you make that turn, let's say you've got your junior year, your senior year, where you really focus on getting recruited. 
and then you are playing it. It's a job when you're in college, right? Even though it can be a very fun job. I mean, right there, that's a minimum of six years of where the game has became a little bit more like work. Yep. Um, so I totally, I'm a big proponent of it, you know, hopefully being fun the entire time, yeah. <laughs> but of fun being the priority as long as possible. Yes. Sure. Yes. Uh, and it doesn't mean fun and fun. Last point, like fun and winning aren't mutually exclusive either. It's not like when you're younger, like I'm not trying to say like, if you're 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 on this call and like, you're like, well, I, I like to win. Yeah. Like, hell yeah. You better like to win. I hope you like to win. Right. But like, that's the pure joy of playing playing sport right and and it just changes a little bit as as you get older yeah absolutely all right another question um is running a good thing for catchers to do does do you think that it helps um, their legs would it help them with pop time oof um this is a little bit out of my expertise just because i'm not a like certified strength trainer um if I had to insert my two cents. I would much rather see if it, if running is the thing that you would want to do just from the people that I've talked to on the strength side, I think, uh, focus your time more on the sprint aspect of running than like the long distance aspect of running. Um, again, I think long distance running has its merits and there's plenty of people that do it, but softball is all about being an explosive sport, right? And catching is all about being an explosive position and there's nothing explosive about long distance running um if anything like that sprint practicing those sprints and getting faster there's explosion in there and i think that's probably way more translatable to um catching than it is like long distance running and um again not my not really my field although i collaborate with a lot of strength trainers just because i i think it's very important um if you if if you are in a position where you have the ability to strength train um wh whether there's a gym or a coach um you know within a close vicinity of where you live i cannot emphasize enough how um how important it is and and it doesn't matter what age you are if if you want to be a serious athlete and you want to get a lot stronger strength training is the answer to that yeah absolutely uh how many days a week should you work out and should you do the same workout each time i think that all depends on like the type uh that all depends on like the time of year um like what's going on um you know are you in the middle of your competitive season let's like forget the pandemic going on and just think like normal terms. Um, are you in the middle of your competitive summer season? Is it, um, you know, the fall competitive season? Is it the winter? Like what time of year it is, I think suggests like what you should be doing with your time. Um, I, I don't like the idea of maybe saying like there's a hard limit of like hours or days you have to practice at the end of the day. Like if you like what you're doing, you're going to do it more. And if you don't like it, you're not going to do it. Right. Um, and there's times where you have to do things you don't like to do, but if you like catching, you're going to want to put in time to become a better catcher. And really, if you're like, well, I don't have a pitching machine. I don't have, you don't need much. Like the kids that are in classes right now with me, they've got a tennis ball and a wall. Like you can do a lot with a tennis ball and a wall. Um, or a tennis ball and someone who can toss it to you. Um, so I, again, I, I think it's, I would go more based on like, is this something you really like? And if it is, you're going to put a lot of time into getting better and owning that craft. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Let's see. Um, I think we have two more questions. Cool. Oh, I like this one a lot. What is something you do to keep a defense calm during tense situations with all eyes on you as the catcher? <sighs> Um, that is a really, really good question. And, um, I never played in front of big crowds per se. Um, you know, I played in two national championships, but the crowds, sometimes the home games that we played at, at Tufts were bigger than the national championship crowds, if you can believe that. Um, but nonetheless, like the pressure was certainly felt right. Um, I think, you know, confident, confidence is one of those funny words that like everyone knows what it looks like and what it feels like when you have it, but it's really hard to define it um, in words. And, and I think when I think about confidence, like I think about it in terms of experience, right? Um, like we've been there before and, and whatever, you know, we've been there before means like we've caught balls before we've, you know, we've received, we've hit, like you've done all of those things. And I get that, like, maybe the moment means a little bit more because it's the national championship or the PGF national championship or whatever it is. Right. I get that the moment means a little bit more, 
but the actions are still the same. You're still doing the things that you've done all this time, right? And so again, this isn't maybe the direct answer that you're looking for, but I think collectively the infield, ha there has to be a calm and a, and a, a confidence amongst the players to say like, hey, we've done this before. Like we've played before, right? Um, and I think that comes from like the gelling and practice, right? Like to know, I mean, I remember those national championship teams. I could look out on the field and be like, that's the best damn shortstop in the, the U.S. Like she's right there and she's on my team, right? And like there's there's a lot of merit in looking out at the field and saying like I've got the best on my team and I wouldn't I wouldn't choose any other person to be in that position if I had the choice, right? Um, and and that kind of like collective trust and that collective um, confidence is is going to get you through those pressured situations. Yeah, totally. And just to add on to a little bit about what you said, I mean, I think you showing up because you've been there, you showing up and being consistent and just being the player that you were yesterday that they've already seen the whole season or whatever, that can calm them down, right? So you said you came out in between every hitter three to four feet in front of the plate and talked to them, looked every infielder in the eye, right? So if you continue to do that, even during the 10 situations, you don't go inside yourself and all of a sudden get silent, then you'll be able to keep those, those, uh, your teammates calm. Right. And I think there's, I, I totally agree with that. And I think there's this like fine balance when you are in those big moments, like whatever that big moment means to you. Like, I think there's a fine balance between sitting on the bench and being like, holy crap, I'm in the national championship game. But like, like, and I had those moments. I will, I will definitely admit them to you. But at the same time, like you can't just live in that space. Cause if you do, you're going to be like, totally like your mind's just totally in the wrong place. Right. And so there's going to be that balance of like, yes, you're there, but also like, this is a game. Like, and we've been playing the game of softball for how many years now? And like, this is something that I can just like, you know, act pretty naturally doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. We got our last question here. You may have partially answered this, and this is also probably a good segue for you to give out your information in case people want to reach out. But uh, Liliana asks what your top three favorite catching drills are. Yeah. So I feel like I definitely answered that in terms of um, kind of like the one drill I would pick for each of the skills. Um, I, I don't really have a top three because if anything, like I could pull up for you on, you know, a Google drive, like basically what the progressions are for each skill. Right. And like, whether you're a 12 U kid or you're an 18 U kid, like it depends on kind of where you are in that progression, but that's kind of what the kids are. That's what like the players are getting when they're coming to me is like, you're here and we want you to be here. And so we need you to go through X progression in order to kind of get your skill up to that level. Um, so I don't know if I have a favorite just because, like it's built into the progression. Um, there's more, there's ones that are really fun to watch kids do because they're really challenging and they hate them because they're hard and um, they're not successful usually at first. But um, I, I just think that it's hard to pick one just because they're in progressions. And I, I, I'll totally take the segue on that is like, Liliana, if you want to know what those progressions are, like you need to reach out to me because I will give you the progressions, right? Um, so for people that are listening, uh, probably the best way to reach me is um, on email or social media. So my email is Johanna, J-O-H-A-N-N-A -N -N dot Claire, C-L-A-I-R, no E, um, at PTP softball.com and then I have Instagram and Twitter as well so that's PTP softball for both of those accounts whether you want to direct message me on those just say you listen to, you listen to this webinar and you want to know more and I would be happy, more than happy to give you all of the knowledge that I have to make you the best catcher that you can be awesome I appreciate you being so open and willing to share and just making our sport better that's great we need more coaches like that right yeah <laughs> all I right so, so you what I hope so. Yes, we need more. Yeah. <laughs> hey, who knows? Maybe some people on these calls are future coaches, right? They are, right? <laughs> Which I think my final plug would be just because you just said that. Yeah, like, I know what you're going to say. <laughs> uh, it's so important that <laughs> this is my like, this is my soapbox right here, right? Like, it's so important that um, there are young females, and not to say there's not older females too, but there's young females in coaching positions because now all of the young people that are on this call are like, wow. Caitlin's job is so cool. They're like coach Joe's job is so cool. Like I want to be them. And guess what guys you can be right. Like you can be a coach and, and that is only better for our sport that there's more females involved in our coach. And again, not sliding my male counterparts. Um, but I want to see the fit, the female representation that our, our sport deserves. Right. So if you're sitting on the call and you're like coaching sounds so cool, 
yeah, it is really cool. Let me be the first to tell you. And you should definitely figure out how you can go into coaching in the future, whether that's just like on the side or it's something you want to do full time. But um, it, it's really important that people like us are in these positions because it's showing them that, hey, they can do that. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. You ready to do our last prize giveaway? Let's do it. Okay. Awesome. Pick a good one. All right. Last one. Uh, Giselle Ramirez. Giselle Woo! Ramirez, thank you for being here. You've won one of Joe's Protect the Plate t-shirts. So send me an email, ccain at texasblaze.org. Um, I'll get your information and we'll get that t-shirt sent to you. So Joe, thank you so much for being here. This is awesome. This is highly informative. I really feel bad ending it because I'd like to talk softball with you for another four hours, but um, try not to take up too much of you. Oh, and you have lessons to get to, right? Yeah. yeah um, busy working woman. So yeah, thank you so much. This was really informative and thank you to all of our listeners, to all of our attendees. Really appreciate you guys taking me 90 minutes on a Thursday to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin, for putting these on. I think it's super important to, you know, bring um, minds on to talk about what they're doing in the sport of softball. And um, again, whether you're a catcher or um, a coach, like you prioritize yourself, right? Prioritize the catchers. It's such an important position. And there are simple things that we can be doing to uh, make this position even stronger and even better. And, and I encourage you to do that. And if you don't know how, that is why people like me exist. Awesome. Yeah. Love it. All right. Thank you, Joe. Have a great day and um, everybody stay safe. All right. Thank you.